yeah, we can talk about managing unmanageable shit. That's, that's the thing we have a lot of experience with, and so welcome. If that's not what you thought you were getting yourself into, or you didn't expect it to have swears on the title slide, that's the Jonathan and Melissa experience that Sarah was referring to. We got 93 people. We'll see if, like, shit on the title slide, anybody drops that. Oh, we'll no. We're, we're, gone we're watching. We're yeah. watching. All right. Okay. Um, so as we started to put our heads together and think about um, what does it mean to manage unmanageable shit, we basically came up with five rules. There are five rules that we're going to walk through. We should probably tell them why we have anything to say about managing unmanageable shit in the first place. It's like Sarah said, I ran marketing at Wattpad and you ran product at Hubba. For like but, an hour. But yeah. that doesn't tell anybody why they should trust us on like crisis and hard stuff. Okay, go. Uh, so we spent a lot of time, when Jonathan and I first met, uh, we spent a whole bunch of time doing crisis response for a browser that was used by half a billion people worldwide. And most of that time was spent doing crisis response around people who couldn't keep their heads during crisis. And so we learned uh, pretty early on that like being able to keep your head cool when shit goes off is a skill. Yeah, before starting Raw Signal Group, Melissa and I were not trainers. Mm -hmm. we, the, the management and leadership training that we do now, we've only been doing for about the last three, four years. Um, prior to that, we've both been in tech, you know, mostly in startups or at least fast growing organizations for about 20 years. And we met, as Melissa said, in the early days of Mozilla working on the Firefox browser, back when Firefox was ascendant and was gaining users minute by minute by minute. Um, and in particular, we met because I was working on security engineering and Melissa was working on communications. And so anytime there was a security issue with Firefox, as she said, we were putting half a billion people at risk. And how you talk calmly and swiftly about that and how you don't freak out when a lot of people in the organization are freaking out are the lessons that we learned over and over again until we got really good at them. And so we've never had to manage in a global pandemic like this. Nobody since 1918 really has. Um, but we have seen what happens when an organization or when humans are going through some really stressful shit and, and the patterns are pretty consistent and that's what gets us to here. Cool. Five, Five rules. rules. All right. Uh, the first one, respect first. the fog. Go ahead. All right. Um, there's a thing that happens anytime crisis hits and my hunch is that it's happened to many of you on the call, which is that at some point in the last month, it got to be too much. Uh, the ability, go ahead. A lot of the words that people use when like, in terms of too much, people rarely say it's too much, although sometimes they say that, but often the words are like, I, I can't figure out what to do next. I'm like having a really hard time making decisions. Um, I get up, but like, I'm not sure what day it is or what I was supposed to be doing. I like, I scroll, but I, I am not sure. Like I went to the computer for a reason and I can't remember what that was. There's a disconnectedness, yeah. right? Like sometimes you can diagnose it and say, oh, I'm, I'm having a lot of trouble figuring out my priorities right now. Or I'm having a lot of trouble figuring out what work matters. A lot of the time it's, it, you just stuck, right? Like mm -hmm. if the rest of the world weren't going through a pandemic, you, you just describe yourself as depressed. Like I just don't have the ability to, to motivate work like I used to, right? Work in the like capital W sense or even just stuff like showering. Right when the fog descends, the the way it feels is really scattered. Like your brain can't sort of come together around an idea. Um, and for some people, that lights up a ton of anxiety and worry, and they keep trying to hold the whole thing in their brain and they can't. And for other people, they just sort of collapse. Um, neither of those is particularly helpful. But but the thing that really doesn't help is trying to fight against it, to to try to like insist. You know, I, I've got to. I've got to do work. I've got to show that I'm performing in my job. I've got to like go make plans or make a sourdough starter or whatever, or learn a new language. Like I have to do those things to prove that I'm better than the fog. That's not how fog works. No, we, we talked, I mean, we spend a lot of our time talking to bosses, right? And so we're talking to leaders who are being asked to do like three, five, 10 year strategic plans in the first week of shelter in place. Like in the first week of everybody switching their entire work context, we're being asked to think like 10 years out and they're like, I'm having a hard time. And we're like, you would, like that is an impossible ask for most people. Yeah. Um, instead, when we talk about respecting the fog, right? I don't surf, Melissa surfs, but I know that surfers talk about this a lot, that like the ocean can be fun, right? You can learn how to ride waves, that's cool. You have to respect the water, yeah. right? You have to meet it where it is because if you try to be better than it, it will remind you who's winning. Um, and there's something similar that happens with fog, which is that when you're in it, if you sort of imagine like a five point scale, right? And five is clear, it's like pre-pandemic clear, or maybe you weren't clear before the pandemic, but like, it's having a sense of like who I am, what's important, what I need to get done, right? If that's five out of five, 
and one out of five is like, I'm totally in fog and I can't see further mm -hmm. than this afternoon, right? Understand that when you're in that one, you can't will it away. There's stuff, we're gonna talk about it in some of the upcoming rules. There's stuff you can do to get yourself out of it, but one of the things is going to be time and that it's cyclic, right? You're, you might be at a one now, there might be people on the call who are like, I'm already at five. I was foggy two weeks ago, but like, this is boring to me, I'm past it. Good for you, yep. like, good for you, five That's, people, like, well done. How wonderful. But, uh, but like, it's on a permanent state, right? No, no, it, it moves in waves, right? And you're gonna find, you're gonna learn some new piece of information um, or something's gonna surprise you, or I hope not, you know, somebody, somebody that you care about is gonna get sick or whatever, but you're gonna find yourself right back in fog. Um, understand that it's cyclic and that when you have clarity, that's a great time to be making decisions, thinking through long-term stuff, making plans and stuff. But if you don't have that clarity today, you gotta meet it where it is, right? The, 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 a big mistake in any kind of crisis, whether it's at work, whether it's at home, whatever, is to try and make decisions from a place where you can't realistically make decisions. Fogley, I don't know, I don't know how many of you are old enough to have had those like finger traps as kids where like the harder you pull against it, like the more stuck you are. Fog is like that, right? The harder you the harder you push and insist like, no, I'm able to make it, I'm able to make sound decisions just by the fact that I can't see more than two feet in front of me. Like it, it it's really, really hard and it reinforces it, right? The the more you try and fight against it, the more stuck you are. Respect the fog. That's the first rule. Uh, it's a really hard one. It's really hard to sort of master your own urge to go do something and be productive. And it's why there are like warring factions in social media where a bunch of people are like, you gotta do chin ups and make sourdough and learn to knit and stuff like that. And then there are other people saying, don't force me to be productive. That like, brings us to the second rule. Yeah, perfect. Great All right. transition. Welcome. Second rule uh, is no one is crushing it out there. Um, I ran high school track and I was neither the fastest nor the slowest, but I'm one of those people where like, if I'm not out and going and doing, then I'm not at my best self. And so I conscripted a device to help me remember that I need to move all the time. Um, and usually it's a really helpful device. Um, and about a month ago, it started noticing that I wasn't going. And it started messaging me being like, your Melissa. Move, your move ring sucks. Your, no, it didn't say your move ring sucks. It kept helpfully saying, would you like to lower your expectations of how much movement you're getting per day? And I, at that time, was like, no, I don't. I would like to just keep denying anything about my situation changing. I'd like to just pretend that everything's happening normally. And my watch was like, cool. But like, I don't, I don't have all of this emotional attachment to things being as they were. Um, are you sure you don't want to lower expectations? And then it would send me gentle nudges that was like, Melissa, like stand up one time today. Like just take three steps from your bed to the living room. Like just do anything at all. Um, and I realized that my watch actually was smarter than I was on a thing, right? Like it actually had figured out that, that I needed to redefine crushing it. That my old step count, my old expectations for me getting shit done were not relevant right now. And I think across the board, a lot of folks are finding that like holding themselves in their now state to their old state expectations is just a recipe for like chronic and constant disappointment, right? Like if, we're, if we have this expectation that the things that we're doing now are anything resembling the level of performance and productivity we had before we were at home, like it, it's just, it's really, really hard to, to sort of maintain those things at the same time. Um, and I think Apple Watch got it right. Like on Monday, I think I finally gave in and was like, okay, fine. And now my watch is like, from a place of lowered expectations, you're totally crushing it. Way to go you. You did like your three steps and you stood up one time today. Nicely done. It's a, it's a funny thing, right, that standing outside of it and looking at other people, most of us can be pretty rational and say, okay, in a context where everything about your life has been turned upside down, a lot of employers are going through layoffs in terms of your work life, but even in terms of your home life, you can't go out and hang out with friends and stuff. You could stand outside of that and say to someone else, well, be reasonable. Like, obviously, you're not going to be working and, and sort of hitting your targets, whatever they are. The, the same way you would have six months ago. It doesn't make any sense, right? But internally, what we're hearing from a lot of the people we talk to is that they're still trying to hold themselves to that bar. In fact, some of them are trying to hold themselves to it more. Mm -hmm. They're like, I wanted remote work. My company finally gave me remote work. I got to go earn it now. Where right? half my team got laid off and I didn't. And I, I'm really That's worried. Some survivor guilt shit. Yeah, yeah. And I'm really, like, now I have to pick up like all the work that was there before. And also, I'm, I'm really stressed out. Yeah. And even even if you feel basically okay, like I, I don't think we're trying to sort of frighten you. If, if you feel basically like eh, maybe a four out of five on clarity, right? Like, it, you know, there's some swirl, but I think I know what I'm doing. 
and I basically feel like I can get my job done and I basically feel like I can go for a walk every morning and stuff, that's great. But recognize that even if that's how you feel, the people around you are in whatever their own state is, right? And so the assumptions you have in terms of what, what bar you can hold yourself to, mm -hmm. that's a good place to start. But it's also worth checking in on like, how are, how are the people around you doing? And is it reasonable to expect them to be crushing it at the same level that they were? Could be like esteemed colleagues, right? Could be like your best friends, running buddies, whatever. They've suddenly got very different lives too. And so the, the assumption starts with you, but it, but it projects out to the things you expect from other people too. Um, and Melissa said it well, that just like to do the other thing is to set yourself up for disappointment. Yeah, maybe somebody's going to do something heroic and really knock it out of the park on a thing you didn't think they were going to get done, right? But a lot of heroism, a lot of articles are being written right now about the heroism of people who, are do who have caregiving duties at home or who have mm -hmm. kids at home or whatever and who are logging on from like 11 p.m. to 4 a.m. and just banging out as much work as they can before they collapse into a heat. And for like a week, that's heroic. But, but we're on day 32 of this thing, yeah. at least in Canada. And like, that's, it's not a reasonable ongoing expectation. If, if workloads at work haven't been adjusted, if your expectations on yourself haven't been adjusted, like you're, gonna, you're just gonna cook yourself, which is maybe a nice transition to the third rule. Many of you will know this rule. I know, it's a cliche. It's a cliche. Um, Jonathan and I used to spend a lot of time on airplanes, and so we, we like this one, right? So the rule on the airplane is that if the plane is, is going down, if something, if shit gets real, right? Like you apply your own mask first. Um, and basically you apply your own mask first because you will lose oxygen as quickly as everybody else on the plane. And if you don't have a mask, you cannot help anybody else. The, the versions here. Sarah I think, says it's a good cliche. Thank you, Sarah. You know. They get to be cliche because they get repeated a lot. Doesn't always mean they're true. Um, the problem I have is that a lot of people quote this and it, it almost serves to shame you, right? Like it's like apply your own mask first. And you're like, not only are you struggling to be a hero for everyone around you, but I would like to also critique the fact <laughs> that you're not doing enough on self-care, right? And I, I find that hard sometimes. So let's come back to basics, right? When we say it, most of what we're talking about is, is a, a really well understood phenomenon, right? We, we work with bosses during the day. And one of the things we tell bosses is, look, stress is not a good place for making creative collaborative decisions, right? And a challenge with a global pandemic and 2 million people infected and like lots of people dying. Don't stress them out more. Is that that's stressful. That's not me. <laughs> <laughs> That's fucking coronavirus. It's stressful. And the problem is that sitting in like acute stress because there's a lion chasing you. Okay. Good. Okay, fine. Like some, some panic responses, some fight or flight responses are probably okay there. Sitting in chronic stress though is really damaging. And in particular, for those of you who are, who are trying to work still in the midst of all this, right? Being in a like high cortisol, high stress context shuts down your willingness to collaborate makes you more likely to perceive disagreement as a personal attack, makes you consider fewer options before reaching a decision, makes you more likely to invoke authority instead of like trust, right? Like there's a bunch of really predictable things it does to group dynamics. We, we were talking to a leader who was talking about like, I just had to pull my hands off the keyboard because I was just watching the Slack scroll and it, she, she was like, it just wasn't my best self. I just pulled my hands off of the keyboard. Yeah. Um, we have a, a t-shirt. An acronym. Yeah, uh, HALT. Uh, we stole it from the Burning Man community, but it actually shows up in a lot of different communities. But HALT stands for hungry, angry, lonely, tired. And we really like HALT because the, the first rule of HALT is just like, stop making it worse, right? Like if you're in a bad situation, stop what you're doing. Yeah, HALT is a checklist. Yep. And it, it's gotta be short or you won't do it, right? But if you're, if you're talking with someone at work, in your home life, with your family, whatever, if you're talking with someone and you can't believe what a fucking idiot they are, HALT, halt right? Like, it's, it's the ironclad rule, right? You walk out your door, you meet an asshole, you met an asshole. You walk out your door and everyone's an asshole, you're, you're the, the asshole, asshole. right? <laughs> that like, hungry, angry, lonely, tired. The more you're ticking those boxes, the more likely it is that like you're not hearing people the way they're intending to be heard. And you don't have any of the context, right? Like so much of how we are used to communicating with our colleagues, with our families, with our friends involves being in person. And so we're, we are shifting to, to sort of more distributed. And yes, you may have face-to-face -face from like 
you know, the, the sort of Zoom box, but we're missing a lot of the things that usually allow us to, to sort of connect with other humans. And so if you're finding that you're feeling more disconnected than usual, like, yes, it makes a, a lot of sense, but it also from behind a screen makes it much easier to feel like your, your sort of colleagues, friends, and families are all, are all sort of assholes. The other reason that we like HALT is that unlike just sort of generic, remember to take care of yourself advice, uh, HALT gives you a diagnostic tool, right? If you, if you say, am I hungry? No, I just ate. It's not bad, right? Am I, am I tired? Yes, probably. Probably, right? And this is, this is a great, if, you, if you're a book reader, this is a great time to read Why We Sleep, because it's all about how important that is. Um, if you think you're the, the sort of exceptional person, right, like those presidents who, who could sleep four hours a night and be super productive, those people, by and large, don't exist. You might just be chronically underslept, and right? Lonely, I think, like, universally. Like, it is a global pandemic. Like, I think, uh, what did you say? 90% of the kids in the, in the yeah, world are somebody's... not in school right now. Like, this is a global pandemic. Most of us are sheltering in place, but we're removed from friends or we're removed from family. We're removed from sort of a lot of the, the hallmarks of normalcy. Yeah, and even when you're locked in your home, right? Like, Melissa and I joke about it a lot. We're introverts. We don't we go out, we run an event for like 140 bosses. It's, it's incredible, right? But then we come home and we stare at a wall, right? There's, there's no point at which we seem lonely in that way, right? We, we're surrounded by people in the, in the before times. Um, but lonely doesn't mean proximity to other people, right? Lonely means do I have people that I can talk to about shit? Do I, do I feel supported, right? And some of you are gonna have that and, and being locked in with your family is gonna give you more access to that and that's wonderful. Or you've built healthy habits around like, we have a nightly Zoom check-in or, or like my group text is super active, right? If that, if that resolves lonely for you, that's great. It's also like there's a lot of online therapy right now and it, it is a good thing to invest in if you feel like you're, you're struggling with some of this stuff. Yeah, that's what I was going to say was that a lot of folks may feel like they have people that they can talk to but only about a set of topics and then there's a set of topics like how much they don't like the person that they're sheltering in place with as a for instance, like that they can't talk about that with that person. And so for, for those folks, I'd say like if there are things that you need to talk about but don't have a person sheltering in place with you where you have an outlet for it, um, Ontario is doing a lot of work on teletherapy. I think Cross Canada, I know BC is doing a lot of work there too to bring sort of therapy be online so that people can access that as a resource yeah there's uh, uh anytime we talk about sleep there are people who are like oh i've got sleep shit like i've always had sleep shit I, mm -hmm. since, I, since my you know early 20s i haven't been able to get a good night's sleep um the who right now is mostly known for coronavirus stuff but the rest of their web pages are up and they actually have a checklist of like sleep hygiene things right that runs through if you're having trouble with sleep here are the 11 things that you should do, right? Get lots of sun first thing in the morning because it helps reset your circadian rhythms. Don't have too many lights on after dinner because like it messes with your brain. Don't stare at blue screens at the end of the night. We won't belabor it. My point is like, this is a, this is it. We're too early for silver linings, but this is an opportunity to reset your sleep shit if it's busted. Um, the only other thing I'd add on hungry, because I think we, we skipped over it quickly, is just that like for many of us, our schedules are so far removed from what our schedules were that like we, we especially folks who are, who are trying to maintain a work day while working from home, um, they'll look up and it'll be three o'clock in the afternoon and they're like, oh, I've had coffee, but nothing else. And so just that there, there's going to need to be deliberacy around it. And if you need to use an alarm or a buzzer, just to remind yourself, like it's noon, it's time to stand up, like it's time to stretch. Um, there's no shame in it. Our, our kid's iPad right now has like seven different alarms yeah. for snack time and lunch time and outdoor time and stuff like that. Because like that's what they have at school, right? Yeah. Like there's just there's usually a lot more signal when it's time to to sort of have lunch because everybody else is having lunch too. And when you're home, you don't have that. Okay, so here's the thing: if you've done the work on sort of embracing the fog, if you can't do that, at least respecting the fog, right, and recognizing that in a foggy place that we can't make good decisions about what we're working on or, or how we're running our life. If you reset your expectations for what's realistic while we're locked down, and if you're starting to invest in sleep, healthy eating, exercise to the extent that you can do it, quiet time, therapy, like all the stuff to get you healthy, good news. You're starting to get to the point where you can start to make decisions that are gonna make this better. And that starts. It's like the perfect time to stop doing the wrong shit. Right. Go ahead. Um, so I think a lot of folks find that like uh, they're they're doing the port. They're like, okay, well, like I used to meet with my friends and we used to go to brunch on Sundays, and now we just have Sunday brunch but at home. And so they're porting. They're doing the like this thing was an offline activity, and now I'm just bringing it online, and then like filling up all of the space. 
one of the neat things about the space is it gives you time to reflect, right? Like modern life does not have a lot of opportunities for us to pause and take notice and take stock. But if you're at a spot where you've sort of mastered the pieces of, of halt, if you've got some of the, the more sort of core elements of resilience in place and you find that you've got a day where you feel less foggy than you have, right? Maybe it's a day where like, the sun comes out and you're just like, I don't know why, birds are singing, sun's out, I got some vitamin D and I'm just feeling clearer than I have. There's a neat thing that you can do in that moment. Yeah, seize those moments, right? You'll get more of them over time. But right now, you, you may have an hour a week when that's the case, right? Maybe if you've got kids at home, maybe only after they go to sleep, whatever it is, that moment, the, the first most valuable thing you can do if you've got clarity and energy around sort of your work and your life and making changes, is to, is to put down the shit that's no longer serving you. And, and I, I don't actually mean that in a gigantic sort of therapy reevaluate your life way. I mean it in a narrow 2020 way. So here's, here's my quick team. We're talking to bosses and we're already telling them whatever goals you set at the beginning of the year, throw them in the garbage. You may have had big things that you wanted to do, right? You may have made big deposits on stuff. You may have like big plans in place. You may have brought on agencies to throw it in the garbage because because whatever, like there are businesses who are thriving. Mm -hmm. I was talking to an investor the other day who invested in a company that does mail order pharmaceuticals. They're doing great, right? But like, even still, the plans that they made back in 2020 aren't gonna reflect what's going on, right? It's, it's not, I'm not saying your plans have to be worse. I'm saying, I guarantee your plans are different. And a lot of people aren't there. There was an article mm -hmm. yesterday on Axios about how cruise bookings in 2021 are up. What? Right? Cruise bookings in 2021 are up because a bunch of people still in the fog haven't canceled them. And a bunch of people who have been locked in their house for a month and be like, you know what's going to be great? Going on a cruise. And so 2021 cruise bookings are up. Like those people have not grappled with their shit yet. I'm just, I'm just, it's really hard to stare down April of 2020 and say, I want to get on a boat with 2,500 people. Right. And like, I'm so sympathetic to the people in the cruise industry. Those are people who have not grappled with their shit. Right. If you have a moment of clarity, grapple with yours. If you've got stuff at work, if you've got stuff in your life that you were planning to do, right. Mourn it. If you need to, there was that great article back in the second week on the Atlantic about like having to mourn the plans that we had in the mm -hmm. spring that we thought we were going to have. Right. Mourn it if you need to. And then like start to figure out what your new plan looks like. I think the, the things that you're listening for in your inside voice, you're listening for, I don't want to. I don't want to right now is a really important signal. And the other one that you're listening for, especially in the context of trying to get any work done, is this doesn't make sense. This used to make, sense, make sense, but it doesn't make sense right now. Or I don't know how it connects. Those are, those are all really good instincts right now that something has shifted and you haven't necessarily brought your plans into the modern era. All right. Um, and it segues nicely to the last rule, right? Only once you've done everything else, one through four, can we start to talk about doing the right shit. Um, you can't fast forward to this step. A bunch of people did. A bunch of people in week one were like, okay, crisis. What's our plan for the next six to 12 months, right? There was a great article that we included in our newsletter that was talking about like staring down the future right now. You need a six month, one year, and three year plan for your business. And I'm like, that is true and impossible. Nobody can do that right now. Like it's great advice for aliens, but like no human is capable of that kind of planning right now. So like once you've done steps one to four, that's when we can start figuring out like what's the new stuff. My, there, there's two versions here that are really helpful. My favorite is like the full on table flip. Like just if you, if you were a ragey teenager and I was a very ragey teenager, <laughs> like this one is for you. Like you go full table flip and you're like, I'm throwing out everything that existed before and I'm just going full on blank slate. I'm looking at a blank sheet of paper and I'm like, what needs to be on it? And what makes sense in April of 2020, right? Like I, I give zero shits what made sense in March, what made sense in February. I'm looking at it from fresh eyes. Not everybody is a full-on table flip person. No, if, if you can do that, if you can do blank piece of paper, I think it's really powerful, right? It's, it's powerful to say, even the, the psychotherapy people all talk about it. Like, what stories am I telling about myself that are no longer true? Well, wait for a clarity moment for that one. What stories am I telling about myself that are no longer true? And like, if you can unlock that, then you must not have kids throwing things at your face. But like, how nice for you. Like, Seize that moment. What an incredible Christ-attunity, right? For everyone else, 
the other way to look at this is as a work back, mm -hmm. right? A lot of people find a work back really helpful. And for those of you who haven't encountered it before, what we mean is like, pick a date in the future, right? Ideally a date that has some genuine significance to you. So maybe it's the end of the year, right? What am I gonna be doing for New Year's Eve? And if I can't think that far ahead, okay, for us right now, it's like, we sort of given up on this school year. And so we're like, will there be camps? And if, if, there, if camps are canceled too, will there be school in September? right and so like we're so hopeful on that last point we're so hopeful seriously on god damn but like <laughs> if we say like september there's going to be school and we just say even if they have to delay it another month there's going to be school at some point from that anchor i can start to work backwards and say well if that's true what do we have to do between now and then because it it stops me having to hold the whole world in my head right even from a place of investing in clarity and investing in resilience and waiting until the fog is lifted enough that i can start to be thoughtful about it we really only want to be thinking out to like the next six months what would need to be true in order for the kids to go back what would that mean for our business mm -hmm. would we need to be like having conversations with companies over the summer so that once the kids go back to school we can spin up work again right like that's wonderful who should those conversations be with? What are they likely to ask us, right? Are they gonna be really reluctant to book with us for an in-person thing until we're further along? And how can we plan ahead against that? Like that stuff starts to be useful, but only once you've cut away all the nonsense. The other thing I'll say is like, if, you, if we've got marketers and product people on the call, I'd say like marketers and product people are very used to applying work back plans in their own day-to-day -day work, but they don't necessarily deploy them against their lives, right? And I feel like it is, it is a tool that ports incredibly well from the office to your personal life, that like it doesn't have to be a work related thing that you're picking in the future if it's just like i want to i don't know like it travels a hard one right now i'm sorry that's a shitty example the new yeah example people talk about like home renos and stuff yeah. right like now it's theoretically a great time for home renovations except that it involves other humans right. also um, that you have to like live in a house while you're no that feels like a like, terrible no, idea do right <laughs> but like many of you may have postponed that stuff or postponed yeah. like buying a condo or whatever you're still renting it's like it's just not the time right now yeah. okay fine how will we know when it is right, right? What is the, and, and i think one of the things that i like about work back plans is as sort of deployed against personal life is that like it makes it feel less like something that's happening to you and it gives you steps it gives you things that you can do it gives you a, a forward-looking point and you're like this is stuff that i actually like do have control over and it's stuff that i can make progress against even while the entire rest of the world is something that right now i don't have a lot of control over the other thing that um you've started to see governments do now is rather than having a work back plan they've started to articulate like what are the gates before we feel more normal Right, like, okay, right now I can't even think about travel, right? Because it, it, it would just make me cry, it makes me right? Sad. It would make me sad to be like, oh, I could go to Barcelona, oh my God, Spain. Like, there'd just be, there'd be so much of that, right? But can I at least say for something like travel, what would need to be true? What are the gates in, in terms of finance, in terms of the kids, in terms of like business, but also in terms of global health, right? Do I, do I need the WHO to declare the pandemic over? Do I need there to be a vaccine, whatever, right? Like sometimes that's gonna feel overwhelming. Don't, don't go down that way if you feel it throwing you back into fog. But for some people, it's enough to say, I can't make the decision right now, but when these three things are different, then I would be able to make that decision, right? And that can be useful because it, it catches your uncertainty where it is. And what you'll find is that in a week, two of those things will have clarified and you're like, holy shit. I feel better about that because like a week ago I didn't know those things and now I do. You can also deploy the tool really narrowly like now that we've, we've sort of done the thing where we threw out the wrong shit and we're pulling in the right shit and we understand that nobody's crushing it from that place if you want to decide that you want to make great sourdough bread like do that like that that seems great you can do a work back plan on like making sourdough bread once you've decided that it's the thing that you actually care about doing versus shit you need to show Being people on Instagram. Instagram. Yeah. yeah. We, our operations manager, Adrian, is on the call, and, and okay. hers is maybe my favorite transformation in the <laughs> pandemic so far. I mean, we were talking to her the other day, and she's like, I've started being on Twitter more. <laughs> and we're like, why? You were never on Twitter before. It was right. that, because like, we're on Twitter, but yeah, like, we're angry and yeah. swear a lot, and Instagram doesn't know about that. But, like, <laughs> but most people are on Insta, and I've, it's always been strange to me, because every time I try to engage with it, I'm like, this is too shiny. Go away. But, like, <laughs> but, uh, Adrian said, no, I've started to be on Twitter. I'm still on Insta, but I've started to be on Twitter more because like Insta is, I won't put words in her mouth, but my understanding was because Insta is fake. It's all happy, shiny. And I, I want to talk about real shit. Um, and Twitter is angry 
uh, and full of terrible people, but like also more real shit. And, and I feel that, right? If you dig to the bottom yeah. and you're like, the real shit is that I'm just motivated by like Cenobacters fighting against yeast to see who can raise my bread the fastest. There's, there's no shame in it. Love That's it. okay. Just don't do it for somebody else. Yeah. Don't do it to, to pretend that you're crushing it when you're not. You all know that. I'm saying that to other people. You've all internalized that already. All right, ready? That's five rules. We promised five rules for managing unmanageable, unmanageable shit. For those of you who needed a piece to screen grab, there it's you go. this. There you go. Respect the fog. Don't yep. try to overpower it. It's more powerful than you are. All you can do is ride it up and down. No one is crushing it, and that includes you, and that's okay. Lower those expectations for right now. Um, Apply your own mask first, and specifically, invest in your own resilience, right? Eating well, moving your body, uh, sleep. Mm -hmm. right getting those basic health supports in place it's not selfish to do that stuff right I understand work may be asking a lot from you I understand your family may be asking a lot from you you're no good to anybody else if you haven't invested in the basics stop doing the wrong work or stop doing the wrong shit um basically like listening listening deeply for the the sort of nagging hesitation and the nagging hesitation could come in the form of like i don't know whether any of this matters anymore i'm not sure why we we chose this course of action uh this was a thing that made sense before but i don't know whether it still does like listen for those cues because they're important they're trying to tell you something that is that is the wrong shit bucket talking and then once you've gotten that out of the way you can start building a plan for, for what 2020 should actually look like for you, what the right shit is, what the, what's the stuff that either gets you lit up, if that exists, or at least like gives you a sense of forward motion towards things that you care about. Okay, those are our slides. Uh, if you want to find us angrily in the, swearing in the grumpy place. on Twitter, that's where we are. Um, two URLs that you need to know about. So one, we write a bi-weekly newsletter, uh, notionally about management topics, but mostly about stuff stuff uh i guess work stuff typically um but weirdly we went url shopping a little while ago and found out that worldsbestnewsletter.com was available so why? That, why was that available that's ours now and so if you would like to subscribe to the world's best newsletter it is on the domain you would expect and then at the bottom of all these slides you've probably noticed managing 2020.com if you are a boss if you are somebody who bosses people if you if you're a manager if you're a founder if you're a people leader of any stripe we put together a video program a couple weeks ago, just capturing and expanding on some of the stuff that we talked about here and then some other things besides just about what it's like to lead during a crisis and, and what to do now. Uh, you can go find the details there. Thank you for tolerating that tiny little plug. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much. You know. Do we, <laughs> that was do wonderful. We have, we've, got, we've got a whole bunch of questions in the Q&A here. Um, also, if you want, a, a I can. EMW who like, sorry, a shout out to EMW who like helped me correct my number on number of children or number of kids home from school. 1.4 million. 1. Thank you, Elizabeth. Million. That's too many. It's, it's a lot. <laughs> it's too many. Do you want me to read out some of these questions and you can give your answers? We've got, we've got just a few minutes left. Cool. Okay. Amazing. So first question from Allison, should you let your team and or boss um, should you let them know of when you're in the fog? My sense is that uh, anytime you ask a boss question, my first question is how much do you trust that person, yeah. right? Um, and it, 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 I don't mean it as a dodge. I mean that like, I think the shiny answer is of course, everyone should share how they're doing all the time so that we can thoughtfully balance our work in this very difficult time. In these uncertain times, it's important to keep that communication. But like, but some bosses are assholes, right? They haven't taken our training yet. And if they're gonna use that as point scoring against you, how are we gonna, how are we gonna tell you to, to kick yourself like that? Yeah, I would say like one of the things that can be helpful versus sort of leading with I'm very foggy right now, um, or I'm having a hard time making decisions, it comes from a very vulnerable place. So to Jonathan's point, like you have to decide whether that's vulnerability that you're comfortable sharing with your boss or with your peers. But one thing that can be helpful is if you hear something that sounds like clarity from somebody else, if you hear a nugget of somebody talking about like five months out and you're like, how do they know that? Yeah. Right? Like, how would they know that? How is that information that like, 
they seem so confident when they say it. Like, how do they know? Um, that's a great opportunity to say, like, talk me through it, right? Like, talk me through. You got to you got to a conclusion. I'm not questioning the conclusion that you got through, but I would love to hear a little bit more about the process that led you to that. Um, and that can be a really good way to coax yourself out of your own fog and have other folks sort of pull pull you towards their version of clarity as well. And um, fog, we, we talked about it being cyclic, right? Your cycle is going to be misaligned with other people's, and in particular, your boss does not magically have fog clarity that you don't, right? So you, on the one hand, might be feeling really foggy and may bring it to your boss, assuming that you've got a trusting relationship with her, and say, like, this is the thing that I'm struggling with, um, and maybe she's got clarity for you. That's wonderful, right? It may also be that you have clarity, Mm -hmm. That you can look at your work and say, I know we had planned this thing and I know we've already sunk some money. But like massive like marketing like engagement that requires in-person activation seems like a strange choice. I these feel days. like we should shut this down, right? And that your boss may take that moment and be like, oh shit. Like maybe they were a two out of five, right? Maybe they were a three out of five, but you can still smell clarity, mm -hmm. right? And you're going to say that to that person and it's going to, it's going to help pull them up out of it. That's a gift, right? If you find that you've got clarity, share it as much as you can and, and be gracious and patient with the fact that people who are in fog might not see it for what it is. Um, it was in the recent newsletter, right? We said be, be generous with that clarity, yeah. right? All right. That's Great. one. Awesome. Our next question. Um, this is, this is real talk. Uh, we had to lay off half the company. Everyone on my team, except for me, was laid off. Outside of Survivor's Guild, I just feel extremely lonely at work. Every other team still has two or more people. So it feels like they still have some sort of an original support system in place, whereas 99% of her support system at work and previous manager are gone. Uh, so things like celebrating wins is just not the same when you're celebrating with people who truly can't appreciate the amount of work that went into achieving something. Um, how do you build up new support systems? Is it time? Does it come externally? Yeah, um, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Just as a starting point, I'm so sorry. That's that's an incredibly hard situation. Um, I have some thoughts in terms of how you build support. Go ahead. So, um, at a starting point, and and again, like very very different context. But the first time I went from working an agency role to an in-house role, I went from being surrounded by a team of people who understood every ounce and and sort of bit of like blood, sweat, and tears that went into a Wall Street Journal front page like cover story to working in an organization where nobody did, right? Being surrounded basically by engineers who were like, cool, could you do it again tomorrow? And you're like, I died that day. Like, I can't express to you how hard that was. Um, but they, they had no idea, right? Their work, their work situation was really different and their work context was really different. And for me, that, that shift of going from being like, one of many to being one and only meant that I had to, to shove, I got shoved really fast to find more of that, that support system outside, right? To have more folks. And what I ended up doing was finding other people who were running PR as solo practitioners for engineering dominant organizations and had an incredible network as a result, right? Just found folks who were like, I was running PR at Mozilla, found the folks across the street who were running PR at Google, found the other folks who were like working at Salesforce um, and started to build up a network of folks there who, who were really lovely in helping to support those wins, right? It's a shitty time right now. And it's the shittiest way to, to sort of walk into that situation. But those folks probably, if you're, if you're looking at other organizations where they've got folks who are now one of, one of only, um, it can be a really incredible time to start building out some more of that, that peered professional network. Yeah, depending on what happened, you know, the person mentioned that their, their own manager was gone too, right? Um, whoever the new boss is may or may not understand, not, not just like how much went into those wins and, and who was involved and how hard it is to not have those people around, but on a more basic level, like what you do and how you do it and what the challenges are, right? And, and your, your ability to come out of it, like time, yeah, sure. Time, it, it is true that like some of this stuff just needs to be processed through and that has a clock on it. But if you just sit in place for six months, that's only going to be sort of 20% better. That new boss needs to understand what's going on and you need to understand from them what's important now, right? We made choices to, to get rid of a lot of my coworkers, right? But not me. And so beyond survivor's guilt, as you said, mm -hmm. why? Right. Why am I still, why don't we just get rid of the whole department? And, and maybe the answer is sort of superficially obvious, right? Such so a scary question. We, we, you know, we need to, to still do this thing. Yeah, but like lots of companies outsource that thing and we're not doing that, right? So like, 
help me understand, right? What's, what's the vision for the business that says like, a bunch of my team is gone, but I'm still here. Cause I'm sure it's not that I'm just gonna carry six persons workload, right? But like, but it's still important that I'm here. So, okay. And you do it partly because that should feed your own sense of clarity, assuming they have an answer and there's not a guarantee. You also do it because it's the start of like real shit conversations with that boss. And, and that's gonna matter because if you can't have those conversations, time is not going to fix this. And if you can have those conversations, like that's going to feed into fixing this as well. But like, I, I would start there. Okay, thank you. All right, next question. Even if we can get ourselves to number five, start doing the right shit. Uh, we need our team and the rest of the folks we work with to get there too. What are some of your thoughts on how to help bring a lot of others along the path? Uh, it, go ahead. It's like people, where people are on that path is so dependent on what's going on for them at home right now. Mm -hmm. And so we are not all on the same, we're not traveling the path at the same speed. Yeah. Uh, and so maybe just first thing is recognizing that is that wherever you are along those rules, like your, your colleagues are somewhere else. In stable times, even in a fast growing organization, in steady times, most organizations are, are walking and chewing gum at the same time, right? There's several things going on at once. It's like we've got, we're, we're maintaining our core product. We've got two experiments out in market for like features that we're beta testing and stuff. We, we've got a Skunkworks team over here that's building a new thing, right? There's a bunch of stuff going on in a dynamic, rapidly moving organization that's basically operating on stable footing. Um, in a crisis context, the most we can hope for in terms of person, people's clarity is that we can focus on one thing, right? We can focus on the continued existence of this organization, right? And some people are gonna be lit up by that because they believe in the mission of the organization, because they believe in the people running the organization, because it's a nonprofit and they believe in serving the community that that organization serves. Whatever it is, um, that's about as deep as most people can go, is, is what does this organization need to survive so that we can thrive in the future? And so if you feel like you've got some clarity and you know what the work is, the way I will know that you're correct is that the stuff you're doing, that, that a person who cares about this organization as much as you do can look at that and say, yes, mm -hmm. that is how this organization will survive, right? Not like, yes, that would be a cool experiment. Not, yes, that's a way that we can news jack to get a little more traffic to our website right now. But like, that is the stuff that's going to, to keep the lights on and keep our colleagues employed and get us through this. And if you've got that plan, it should do, I mean, people in total fog won't be able to see anything, but like people who are sort of half in, half out, um, they should latch on to that because it feels like safety, right? You, you, you feel like a point of stability and they're gonna want that. If they're not, one possibility is that you just see much more clearly than they do and, and time and communication is gonna help. Yeah, Another so possibility is that you're still in some fog and that you're prioritizing some stuff from before um, that, that you care about, that your department cares about, but that isn't existential for the business, um, and that they're not biting on it because, like, it they can't think from an opportunity place. They can only think from a risk place right now. Or, like, it, it, it has somehow entered one of their, like, wrong shit buckets, right? Where they're like, I hear the things that you're saying, but, like, it, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Okay, are we okay for one more question, and then we'll wrap up? That works. Amazing. Last question. I think a lot of a lot of folks are feeling this, which is why I wanted to choose this one. So any advice for squaring the circle with a boss who says, get rest and look after yourself? And also, why have these 15 change projects or department in the release of all of this? Like, why is everything not getting done and running smoothly? How do you how do you kind of take those two those two things and, and deal with that one person? It's, it's mismanagement. Yeah. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. There's a lot of that out there, which keeps us relatively busy. Yeah. Yeah. But being, being tasked with those two things of like do heroics and impossible things and also go to sleep at a reasonable hour. Like you're, you're not being set up for success in that moment. No, a lot of organizations do it, right? It's like, it's like you've got a giant pickup truck, right? And um, coronavirus comes along and rips out the engine and replaces it with a tiny little lawnmower engine, right? In terms of productivity, that's basically what's happened yeah. to most organizations. But you've got you've got a driver who's like, but I still have to haul my my shit and my trailer, and I don't know why my accent just changed. <laughs> but like, but like you can't, right? You can't. And they're like, no, but I have to. It's a pickup truck. I have to, right? And you're like, I don't care. The engine's not capable of that right now, and so you're going to have to adjust what you have to do, right? 
I, I think just in terms of like real real life advice, your mileage may vary, but real life advice is listen to Way the Way to keep it on the automotive metaphors. Oh, yeah. Mileage. Yeah, yeah, I didn't even do that on purpose. We're just like on it. Okay. Um, Listen to the part of the person saying like, take care of yourself and go to sleep. Like listen to that first and foremost, because like you can't do incredible things unless you do those things. Like that's what we, we just talked about that with apply your own mask first. You can't get any of the incredible work done if you're not sleeping and if you're not taking care of yourself. So like, let's take the boss and let's take it in good faith and assume that the person actually means it. And then I think it's totally reasonable to have from a really resilient place, a good conversation about prioritization. Say so like, I, I am, I am happy to do incredible things for this organization from a well-rested and taken care of place. Let's talk about which three are the most important, not which 15, but which three. That's it. And, and of those three, which one, right? Right. And a, uh, a trick with, this is a trick we, we teach people who are dealing with CEOs. It works particularly well with CEOs, um, is that if you say, can I, CEOs will say no. No. Because they don't have all the context for the thing. And like, they don't want to subvert whichever of their direct reports actually manages you and whatever. Like, can I, it just, all their shields go up because they're not chumps. And, and lots of people have said, can I in the past? And they've said yes, and it's come back to haunt them, right? So their default is no. If you want like the secret cheat code for a CEO, right, or anybody sufficiently senior that they hold, whatever your organizational unit is, um, it's I'm worried. I'm worried that like we've got five things on the go and we're running at reduced capacity and I'm worried that one of them is going to drop and we don't know which one, right? Because the cool thing about CEOs is they're worried too. And so when you say, uh, when you say can I, they're like, no, you're no. another thing I'm going to have to worry about. When you say I'm worried about, they're like, me too. And now you're in charge of that. Go fix that. Right? Or, or I'm also worried about that. But the other four things, I'm like, those, those four things don't matter. Yeah. And if you need to make a choice, make this choice. Yeah, it's, um, it's a thing that I got taught when I moved from director to VP. Um, somebody pulled me aside and said, there's only one difference between a director and a vice president. A director identifies risks. A vice president gets one new sentence in their roster, which is the sentence, I choose to accept that risk. That's the only difference. And and it's really useful, right? That if you're like, hey, as, a, as an individual contributor or a team lead or a manager or a director or whatever, I'm like, I'm worried that we're doing these things. What you wanna do is find someone who can say, yes, focus on this one and I choose to accept the risk that the other four are gonna die, right? And because also like that's strategy. Like that moment where somebody says, focus on this one and the other four will die, that is a moment of strategic clarity for your organization. And like, not every organization has that, but if you find somebody who's got that, that chances are they're very low on fog, if they can, if they can see that clearly. Yeah, and it, it's gonna be existential. It's gonna be like, if you show me these five projects, this one's gonna keep us alive, and these four are cool opportunities that I wish we could pursue, but like, keep us alive first, and then we're gonna focus on the other ones. And that, you know, if they can't give you that, well, shit, then we're just rolling the dice, because. Because the thing that's not going to happen is all five of those things or all 15 of those things are not going to get done. All you've, all you've done is chosen to punt on, on getting to decide which ones are more likely to succeed. And when we talk to bosses, we're like, you, you have an opinion about which one of those five you, or 15 you want to get done. Like, if your people don't know what that opinion is, now is a great time to, to have that conversation. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you both so much for being here. Again, I want to shameless plug managing2020.com, their incredible leadership training program. Um, I'm gonna take it, I think everyone should. Um, and just thank you so much for taking the time. I know you're co-parenting and running a company. It's a lot to do right now to also then come and front tour all of us. So thank you so much. This is a lot of, of fun. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you all for coming out. Bye everybody, thank you. And